So good morning and welcome to the annual Burnis Poll Third Sector Conference. This year we're adopting a slightly different format, uh, you know, given the current restrictions, and that we're delighted that you can join us for a virtual tea or, or coffee. The theme to this year's conference is resilience. How can third sector organisations future proof their organisations and protect against the uncertainties that we're currently facing? So over the course of this week, we're providing a number of different options to assist you with doing just that. This morning, my colleague Gillian Hartless, who's an expert in charity law and has been involved in this sector for, for a number a number of years, will be looking at the options for mergers and consortia. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Gillian. Thanks, Graham. You made me sound slightly ancient with the whole been doing this for a number of years. Not quite as old as that, although there is a, there is a significant birthday coming up if anyone would like to send a card to the offices. Um, lovely to sort of see you and it would be so much nicer, as Graham said, um, seeing you in the office with a bacon roll and a cuppa, but at least this way we can keep our slippers on. Hopefully no one's still in their jammies. I, I draw the line at that. Resilience is the theme, as Graham has said, and I'd like to introduce you to the Resilience Alphabet, which is just a glimpse into the fun slash misery of homeschooling that I've been subjected to this year. And according to the Resilience Alphabet, E is for adapt. So this is when something changes, we may need to change something we do, when we do it, or stop doing it for a while to respond. We may do something differently or start something new. Now, the recommendations on this are for seven-year-olds to try brushing their teeth with their non-dominant hand or to draw a picture with their eyes closed. I'm not recommending that, but what I um, what I would ask is that you keep an open mind because what we are looking at today is a form of adaptation. And for some organisations, your organisation as it currently stands may be able to weather the storm uh, presented by the COVID pandemic. You may be able to continue to go alone as you were before. Some organisations have been able to pivot, I absolutely hate that word, but pivoted to a virtual world doing online counselling sessions. They've been able to retain the local authority service delivery contracts that they had some of the same grant funding contracts that they had previously. But for others, you might be finding things ever more challenging and be looking to do things differently through integration with others. So that's the topic for today, mergers and collaboration. Why are we looking at mergers and collaboration? As I've said, potential means of responding to the, the crisis and the predicted recession. Also, there is this concept that those who are on the board of a third sector organisation have this duty to act in the interests of the organisation, the best interests of the organisation, promote the success of the organisation. And that is one of the, the core duties of charity trustees or directors of a company. But there comes a point in time um, in a potential insolvency situation under the wrongful trading regime or that duty sort of flips and you're looking more at potential creditors of the organisation and minimising the risk to them. Now, those of you who are on the ball with your legal updates will know that there has been a suspension of the wrongful trading regime. That's due to come to an end at the end of April. So the focus by the government, uh, both north and south of the border, has been on doing what they can to help the third sector through development of resilience funds, through relaxation of the, the wrongful trading regime, to give boards the space to actually take business critical decisions and to work their way through some of the difficult issues. But like I say, suspension of the wrongful trading regime is coming to an end at the end of April. That applies to companies. For those of you who are here from limited companies, SKIOs, if there's anyone here from a Scottish Charitable Incorporated organisation, doesn't currently apply, but it's looking like in the future um, a similar regime will apply to SKIOs. So it's just this idea that yes, you should be doing what is in the best interest of your company, but there might come a point in time where that duty slightly shifts focus. And ultimately what I think is most important is what is the best means of preserving what you do for your service users and for the core of your activities? And sometimes limping on and protecting the independence of an organization difficult though it is to give that up, it might not actually be 
quote, is the best means of allowing the continued existence of an organize of an organization's activities. So today I'm going to look at different ends of the spectrum. I'm actually going to start with merger, which is the most difficult one, but I think let's have difficult discussions up front and actually that's what we're seeing by far the most of at the moment, mergers. And then the other end of the spectrum, I look at different uh, forms of collaboration in terms of forming consortia, which is can involve varying degrees of integration, but obviously nothing like a merger, which will ultimately result in some an organization ceasing to exist rather depressingly. So merger. Merger is a term that's used very often in the third sector. Actually, what tends to happen is a takeover, but that's just terminology that would not be taken well. And there's a lot of sensitivity around what's being done in this context. So we use the term merger and really all that is used to refer to is where two or more organisations are formally combining to form another organisation. It is a dirty word. Uh, people feel very uncomfortable about it. And, and how do we avoid um, merger scepticism? Well, first of all, it depends what's driving the merger. The best ones are the ones that are led by the organisations themselves, where they've identified that they could do better as part of a larger organisation, rather than ones that are imposed upon organisations. Say a local authority is funding three different recycling charities in the one local authority area that says right well we're not going to do that any any longer so if you want the funding you need to merge that can be very very difficult to manage so it sounds very um sort of softly softly but dialogue really is the best thing and people not holding all their cards close to their chest but being upfront about respective strengths and weaknesses and what you're looking to achieve is something where the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts so if you are a Scottish based organisation you're doing really good work in relation to say a particular um, health sector like a particular um, say a particular form of cancer but you have limited resources and there's a charity south of the border doing something similar but just in England and Wales there might be merit in your merging with them getting access to all the resources that they have similarly if you are a mental health charity but you only work with people who have mental health problems as, as a result of addiction then again, you might find that contracts coming out from public sector commissioners are of a larger scale and they're being, you know, the numbers of them are being reduced. So you might want to join with an organisation that deals with mental health more broadly. And one of the key things um, whenever you're looking at a merger is to form a joint steering group of the organisations that are looking to merge. There's actually quite a lot that can be done there um, without recourse to lawyers. Um, so it's definitely something that you should look at as part of any outline business case that's developed. And the advantages are, just as I said at the beginning, it can actually preserve and enhance the work which has been done by a charity, even if, or by a third sector organisation, even if the organisation itself is going to disappear. And that is such a, a phenomenally difficult concept, especially if you've been a founder member and you've put blood, sweat and tears into this. But I think the focus does need to be on how are we going to preserve the core of what we're doing? Administration cuts can obviously be, uh, administration costs can be cut by a centralisation of functions and you can have efficiency increases, stronger purchasing power and the like. Disadvantages, uh, the main one is it's costly. This is one of the key areas where you probably do need to make use of um, solicitors to help guide the process. Well, I saw that um, Tracy Bird of SCVO is on the call and I think there are some materials on mergers available um, from SCVO so I'll pick up um, separately with Tracy on that but yeah in terms of drafting the transfer agreement certainly that is something that would need lawyers. The other main disadvantage is once you've merged there's not really a, an easy out. I took a call once from a guy who he had been the managing director of a third sector organisation they'd merged into another one and he wanted out and there's sort of nothing that can be done about that because the people who'd gone from his board onto the board of the merged organisation their duties are then 
to promote the success of that merged entity. So once it's done, it's difficult to, to unravel. Again, there is that loss of independence. If you have had a specific focus, like the mental health example, working, see it's working with people who have particular issues as a result of addiction or um, you know, young people who've um, had you know, difficulties in their youth, and that has been the core of what you do. You move into a broader mental health charity and some of that can be lost, but there are things that can be done that you can ask for as part of the merger process to slightly mitigate against that. So for example, if your organization is the one that's being subsumed by the larger one, you can ask to have um, space on the board for people coming across from your board who will always have an eye on your original focus and can try and feed that into discussions. You can also ask for a, a slight restructuring of the constitution of the organization that you're going into to make specific reference to uh, a committee that is tasked with looking at issues of strategy and policy linked to the core of what you did previously. And you can also build provisions into the transfer agreement saying we expect the recipient organization to do X, Y, and Z in relation to our policy priorities. Now, once your organization, if you are the smaller one that's going to be wound up, once you're wound up, there's sort of no one there to enforce those legal provisions of the transfer agreement, but it's a marker in the sand. It helps to focus people's minds on this and to it, it's, it makes it slightly more awkward for them to completely diverge from that. And your poor cultural fit as well can be a disadvantage. Say you've come from a smaller staff team, more of a flat structure, and they're moving into more of a traditional hierarchical management structure. That can be tricky as well. So the process, it's actually not as bad um, as people think it is. The first thing that would be done, which would be done by senior management teams is a feasibility study, an outline business case showing the advantages of this, the efficiency savings. Due diligence, um, oh my goodness. This is one that can be incredibly costly if you're using solicitors for this and actually doing myself out of work. I would recommend that there's a lot of this that can actually be done yourselves. In terms of the employment side of things, you might want to speak to someone on that um, and looking at any sort of pensions liability that might come over, especially if you're taking on staff that have come uh, who've had local government pension scheme uh, pensions. But in terms of contracts, what you're looking at is um, if there are grant funding agreements, are there any clawback provisions that are going to be triggered by this merger? So could grant funding be uh, clawed back by the grant funder? And it would really be a case of contacting them an early opportunity and getting their consent to the proposals so that they don't implement that. Looking at what are the business critical commercial contracts and having those transferred over looking at the contracts where there's duplication, where you don't need you know, a certain maintenance agreement because you've already got that in the recipient organization, checking for penalty provisions on termination. Um, so I would tend to see for the commercial contracts ones, uh, use lawyers for the more business critical ones, but a lot of it you can do um, at your own end. And again, if there's specialist intellectual property that you're going to be reliant on, that's something you could maybe pass by a lawyer. So you would do your due diligence um, at the outset once you've made an in principle decision by both boards to merge. And the purpose of it is to basically root out any likely liabilities so that if you're the recipient organization, you know what's coming over. Similarly, if you are the transferring organization, you want to do due diligence to a certain extent on the recipient to make sure that once you've transferred everything over, it's not going to go bust in a few months time. Statutory consents, the, the main one is if there is a charity involved and it is going to be transferring over its assets and operations and thereafter being wound up, you need Oscar's prior consent to the winding up. They need to be given at least 42 days notice. There are differing interpretations of when that should run from. Some people take the view of, oh, well, you know, we'll transfer our assets, but we're not actually going to apply say if it's a company to be struck off the register of companies for a few months. So we only need to count back 42 days from then. 
I wouldn't agree with that at all because you're past the point of no return then. The charity's got no assets whatsoever. Um, I would always take it from actually the next bullet point on my list, which is the the resolution of the members of your organisation resolving to transfer the assets and operations to the recipient and directing the board of the third sector organisation to crack on and do what's necessary to achieve that. That to me is really the sort of main point of no return. So I would count back from then. So you'd get your Oscar consent form in, wait your 42 days, and when Oscar have given consent, you then pass a resolution of the members. Um, I don't have time to go into it on this call, but Rona will laugh because we have had so many calls going, oh, we don't have members, we've only got directors. If you're a company or if you're a CEO, you will always have two levels of decision making. You will always have members and then you'll have the board, either board of directors or board of charity trustees. You might be structured in such um, a way that they are one and the same people. But for the purposes of this, the resolution has to be narrated as a resolution of the members. And in the case of a company, that will be filed with company's house. And then you've got the transfer agreement, which is where uh, someone like me would come in, which is basically the contractual agreement saying organisation A is transferring the entirety of its assets and operations to um, organisation B. Sometimes there's only a partial merger, but I'm assuming for present purposes, this is a full blown merger. Now, there can be a misunderstanding about what the transfer agreement actually achieves. It's the contractual agreement to give effect to that transfer and it will have provisions relating to chupi and liabilities associated with all of the transferring assets and operations. Things like computers, tables, chairs, spoons, coffee cups, they will all just transfer, ownership of those will transfer by virtue of the transfer agreement. But anything like property leases or anything contractual in nature, there are further processes involved with that, I'm afraid. So you need to formally assign those. So an assignation of a lease, with the landlord um, agreeing to all of that, assignations of third party contracts. There can be a difference in approach depending on the value of them. For business critical ones, you absolutely want to go to the third party to that contract and say, here's what's ha happening. You've got a contract with organisation A, but they want to transfer this contract to organisation B. Can you please agree to this? For low value ones, sometimes it's just a bit of a notification that's given to them further down the line. So forms of merger. I am going to be focusing on option three today because options one and two, which are valid options, almost never happen. Um, so this is very high tech, but I don't know if anyone can still see me. Uh, if not, it's not wildly necessary because it's a fairly dud diagram I've got. But option one involves setting up a new entity, which if it's going to be doing something charitable, could be a SKU, could be a company limited by guarantee. And then your existing two organisations, I'm assuming it's just two organisations for present purposes. So let's say two, um, two mental health care charities, but broadly equivalent size. Say one is West Coast, one is East Coast. And there's a reluctance to merge. So instead of having a full blown merger, what you have is you set up this holding entity, which really won't do much. It'll set policy, it'll set overall governance for the group um, and have some efficiencies in terms of back office services, maybe supporting the two subsidiaries. But what you do with the two actual delivery organisations, the mental health based charities, they almost stay as they are. There are no transfers of assets or operations. So it's a lot cheaper in that respect. You're paying the costs associated with setting up the new company, which are relatively low. Um, and you would have a restructuring of the constitutions of the two mental health care charities to convert them to being subsidiaries of the one up here. So say mental health care charity, in the West Coast, membership is open to anyone resident in Glasgow who has an interest in mental health support and care. You would change that to say that membership is only open to this entity up at the top. It really 
isn't a merger in the truest sense. It doesn't achieve all of the benefits of merger or all of the efficiencies, but it's a sort of stepping stone towards it. And it would probably be if you had the benefit of kind of more time and money to sort of test it out before going for a full blown merger, that might be where you do that. Option two is similar, but this time you set up a new company and instead of having the mental health care charities as subsidiaries, they each transfer all of their assets and operations up to the new co and then they each wind up. So you're just left with one company. Very, very costly. You're doubling the work. Um, two lots of transfers and again you would have it where there are real sensitivities where you do not you want to avoid suggestions of a takeover by one or another um, but very costly so you hardly ever see it so what you do see most commonly about 99.9 percent .9 of the time is uh, one organization taking over the assets and operations of the other and then the original one winds up um, and although it can feel like a takeover, normally the decision as to which one is the recipient entity is based on cost. And I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute. And the key point for third sector mergers, which is just wholly weird to corporate finance solicitors, so always check the solicitors you use in this, always use the third sector one, is that there's no money passing hands in terms of payment for the assets and operations. It transfers for no consideration from memory, there's a funny wee quirk. If there is an English charity involved, I think they have to reference some kind of minimal consideration in there. So this is what option three looks like. Either company A transfers to company B as restructured, come on to that, or company B transfers to company A. And it's down to cost, which is the most assets and which would be the most costly to transfer things out of. You'll use that as the recipient. Now, sometimes the recipient entity will just remain as they are. They'll just accept the assets and operations as long as they've checked their objects clause and they're satisfied that all of the operations of the transferring organization can be carried out within the limits of their objects, their existing objects, then they might not change anything. That is a really important point, actually. Um, it's one of the few situations in which um, those on the board of a third sector organisation can be exposed to personal liability if they act out with the remit of their objects clause. So really do a careful audit of all of the operations of the entity that's coming over just to check that they're all covered. In ones where there's maybe a bit more of a, a balance in terms of the respective organisations, the power, you know, it's not a really small one going into a much bigger one. There might be arguments for changing the name of the recipient to reflect um, the broader activities, changing the objects, changing the board structure more radically. But like I say, it really depends on the balance of power. And I've covered the top point there. So the key is that what you would have is you would have a resolution passed by the transferring entity saying that we are going to transfer all of our assets and operations to the recipient and directing the board to do it. And then you might have the recipient passing a resolution to, to restructure their constitution. Just going to pass over that because we've done that and I'm getting short of time. And yet yeah, you have the transfer agreements, um, as we referred to earlier. Key, key point in this, and again, one which causes all sorts of bun fights, is the indemnity position. As I said, the assets and operations are transferring for nil consideration. The recipient does not pay for them, but they sort of pay in kind in that the norm is that the recipient entity indemnifies the transferring entity for any liabilities that crop up. Um, the reason that this is important is that the recipient has divested itself of all of its assets. And if some liability crops up later on, again, there could be personal liability for the board because they've given away all their assets. So the recipient is saying, don't worry, we pick up the tab for this. Quite often it's uh, an open-ended indemnity Sometimes it can be capped at the value of the assets that you are receiving. This causes a bun fight because if there's a solicitor involved who's not a third sector solicitor, this just seems crazy to them. Why on earth would their client offer up this indemnity? 
but it is absolutely recognised and it is standard in this sector. Um, I did once have a partner in another firm slam the phone down on me when I suggested this. So yeah, but his clients then were like, no, no, she's right. <laughs> Um, also, as part of the process, you'll be doing TUPI consultations as well, um, which I am not qualified to advise on, but there is um, material for those of you who are members of SCBO available from SCBO on this. And you're going to your various funders for consent uh, to transfer and on completion of the transfer where there's a company involved, you basically wait three months during which the recipient, the transferring entity has been dormant and then you apply to company's house to have it struck off. And once it's struck off, it was, if it was a charity, you tell Oscar. So that is mergers, <laughs> massive canter through that. Sorry, I'm going so fast, but half an hour is really not very long. So merger, full on integration, point of no return, consortia, not so. Um, this is where your organisation, you do want to retain, remain independent, but there are things that you think, actually, we can't quite do this ourselves, or there's something that we could have achieved better working with others. So the sorts of examples you see it would be bidding for specific contracts or types of contract. Again, say you are a Scottish based organisation, but you're wanting to bid for something that's come out from one of the, the Westminster departments you might form a consortium with English organisations. Again, mental health, you just work in addiction, mental health problems linked to addiction. There are not contracts as narrow as that, for example. So you uh, form a consortium with a wider grouping of members, or it could be geographical. It could be, oh, we only operate in this part of the country, but this is a Scotland wide thing. So we need to form a consortium with organisations throughout Scotland might not be to do uh, with tenders and bidding for contracts. It might be to do with a particular initiative or solving a particular problem. So homelessness, you might have a number of organisations saying, well, we deal with the addiction problems that are linked to homelessness. We deal purely with homelessness and getting people into their own accommodation and supporting them with that. We deal with um, young people leaving the care system. So again, it might be recognising that oh, there's so much benefit in all of us coming together. So that blending of skills and there can be back office efficiency savings. But depending on how it's all structured, there can be legal risks flowing from it, um, especially where you've had failure to perform by one of the parties to the consortia. And there can also just be reputational risk. You know, if it doesn't go that well, even though you've done your bit and done it beautifully, if someone else hasn't, Although there's not necessarily a financial risk for you, it just can dilute what you're all about. So there are two key models for this. This is actually quite important because some of the ones that have come into us recently, they've come at a slightly later stage and people have already gone, oh, we've set up a new legal entity and it's a company limited by shares. And I've gone, hang on. <laughs> That's quite an integrated model. Did you really think that through? And by the way, why company limited by shares? From a tax perspective, that's maybe not the best for you. So you need to stop and think what you're trying to achieve here. Either which way there are contracts involved and quite a few of them, but you can just have it all done on a purely contractual basis without setting up any form of separate legal entity. Or you can set up, which is it's not a merger, but it's certainly on that spectrum further along the line. You can set up a jointly controlled legal entity with your um, consortium partners and you would have, say, say there are three of you. You are each the members of the organisation or the shareholders and you appoint equal representation onto the board of that entity. So really um, integrated decision making. So what I'm looking at here is the advantages and disadvantages of going for that model that involves setting up a separate legal entity. It's good from a governance perspective because when you've set up that separate entity and you've put people on the board of that entity, they are then responsible for acting in the best interests of that new entity. So from a governance perspective and integrated decision making, it can really help to drive that forward. Whereas in one that's based purely in a contractual framework, people can still be a bit like, oh, well, you know, we'll kind of stick to focusing on our organisation within the limits of the contracts. 
Also, when you set up a new legal entity, it has a separate legal personality distinct from the consortium members. Um, so from a it's a separate compartment from the point of view of risk. So your organization will not be the one that enters into say a, a contract with Scottish government. It will be this new legal entity. So theoretically, if this all fails and goes wrong, it's the new legal entity that will go under, not your organization. Having said that, if you've had to give any kind of guarantees in respect of what this new entity is doing until such time as it's built up its reputation, then that would dilute uh, dilute that. Um, and also the, the, the board have the benefits of limited liability as well. And there's a certain amount of financial flexibility with doing this. Theoretically, this organisation can apply for its own borrowings. But again, if if they don't have much in the way of assets to grant security, that idea of um, a separate compartment from the point of view of risk exposure can be diluted. But depending on how it's structured, it can allow for the smooth build up of expertise, which should be less affected by partners coming in and out of the consortium. You know, if, if it has staff of its own, although what tends to happen is that you have secondment of staff and that you have the respective partners contributing assets to it. So that can be the other risk point. If this fails, although no one can really come knocking on the door of your organization, anything you've put in um, would be lost. And the main disadvantages, higher setup costs. Uh, I think there can be quite a lot involved in actually getting, let's say, the articles of association structured in a way that everyone's comfortable with. Conflict of interest causes a lot of scratching of the heads when you've got board members on this new vehicle who've come from the respective consortium entities. Um, there's just more administration and formality, um, board minutes, filing of resolutions with Companies House. And it's harder to walk away. It's harder to disengage. So unless this is something of a long term nature and you are really, really committed to it, um, it's possibly not the one for you. Sorry, that's my phone buzzing. So what type of legal entity? And I promise I am finishing up very soon, uh, five minutes over. Again, this is something I've had to ask people to think about recently. Are you intending to make a profit from this or not? Are you intending to recycle profit surpluses back into the core of what a separate legal entity would do? And some of the advice people have been getting, that's not even been tested. I don't think it's just, oh, we've set up a company limited by shares, end of. Um, so if it is to be profit distributing, you're probably looking at a company limited by shares or an LLP, a limited liability partnership. If not, if there's going to be a recycling of surpluses back into what this does and the individual partners aren't going to take a profit per se, then you could have a company limited by guarantee. Or if you're going to apply for charitable status, you could set it up as a skill as well. Main thing I'd like people to remember um, on the profit distributing one is tax, um, along with a big disclaimer that I am not a, a tax solicitor, but a company limited by shares or any kind of limited company is subject to corporation tax unless, for example, it's registered as a charity. So if you're setting up a joint venture and all of the partners are charities, you can set that up as a company limited by shares and you can have distributions in a tax efficient way from that. But where some of the partners are not charities, you might actually want to consider setting up a limited liability partnership. The reason being that an LLP itself does not pay tax. It's the individual members of an LLP which pay tax according to their own tax status. So for those partners who are not charities, it's sort of neither here nor there to them. But for those who are, if you're a charity and don't pay corporation tax, then you shouldn't pay it as part of an LLP structure. You might have to do a wee bit jiggery pokery setting up a wholly owned non charitable trading subsidiary to be the member of the LLP. Um, you know, where it's not really just an investment, where what you're doing, the core of it isn't really in line with your charitable objectives. But that entity can then gift aid surpluses up to the charitable parent. Um, I that I think is my last slide. Oh, for goodness sake, it's not. I've done more than I thought I'd done. 
very quickly. Surely this is my last one. Oh, yes, it is. So regardless of what you're doing, regardless of whether you're setting up a new entity or not, you will need a consortium agreement. You'll probably need subcontracts as well with the individual consortium members. This is just very high level, the sorts of things you would have in there, the duration of the relationship, the scope of what you're covering. Is it just for one tendering opportunity? Restrictive covenants, which is basically saying um, the various members cannot go off and bid for work similar to what this organisation is going to be doing. What's expected in terms of financial contributions at the outset and on an ongoing basis from the various partners? What's your approach to profit participation going to be? Is it just going to be you know, where you've got a purely contractual consortium? Will it just be dealt with in terms of subcontracts? You would have probably a lead partner in the contractual consortium signing up to a contract with the Scottish Government, and then it would enter into subcontracts with the various individual partners and say, well, whatever you take from this will be dealt with under that. But where you've set up a separate legal entity, like a company limited by shares, eh, what's the split of profits going to be? In an LLP, you would have similar provisions. Um, just to mention on an LLP as well, actually, if you are looking for an exit strategy, it can be slightly easier to exit a company limited by shares because transfer of shares is actually um, something that can be achieved quite easily. It's quite a clear ownership stake. It's a bit more techy doing that with an LLP. But what you have around your exit provisions will be things like if you are wanting to exit a legal entity that you've set up, um, and you're a shareholder in that, there will be preemption rights saying that before you can sell your shares to a third party, they have to be offered to the existing consortium members, which is the right thing because it allows them control over who they are partnering with. Um, and the, the one at the bottom is just this idea of the approach to liability. So again, in where you've set up a limited company or an LLP, it's the one that will take the initial hit. It's the one that enters into contracts and it's the one where liability should sit. Where it's a purely contractual consortium, there can be fairly techy arguments around whether it really is a partnership and sort of several liability for all of the partners. So you want to try and carve things out and say, well, actually, if there's a lead partner signing up to a contract with Scottish Government, it takes the initial hit, but it then is indemnified by the respective subcontractors or those that have actual responsibility for the failings. So yes, uh, throwing loads of information at you there. I'm just going to click on my stop sharing thing. And if we go back to my lovely resilience alphabet, I would suggest that what you might need now is some D for downtime. But you can feel free to T talk to me after this with any Q questions that you have. And hopefully you'll be more up for this than my seven year old was going through this, which was a truly turgid exercise. Does anyone have any questions now? Or like I say, my contact details should be um, available somewhere on this. If not, Emma, the lovely Emma who's organized this can send them out and people can feel free to, to drop me a message. So, yeah, please do get in touch if anyone has any questions. And I don't think Tracy um, of SCBO will mind me mentioning this, but if your organisation is a member of SCBO, we're part of the, we're one of a number of firms that are um, on the SCBO helpline. So, again, any questions you have on this can be, can be routed through them and you get up to two hours. Is that right, Tracy? A free legal Yeah, it's up to two hours, yeah. And um, Gillian, has this been recorded? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Well, I've just put a question in. We maybe put a link to this from our website to this um, presentation. Maybe someone will cut out my nonsense, Harry and Megan chat and anything else. <laughs> I think we can do that actually, but no, I think it um they will be all of the ones from um later on this week as well will be available um on the website. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you, Pamela. Bye. <laughs>